unpopular opinions about Survivor. We all have them, and today I am not only providing you with some of my own, and even unpopular opinions that you all sent me on YouTube and Patreon, but I have fellow Survivor YouTubers, Russell Muscle TV, and Flynn Masters providing some of their opinions as well. Thank you for watching this video, and if you want to watch every video I make early and even pick what I make, then consider joining the Once Upon an Island Patreon. Prices start at $3 a month, and you can cancel at any time. Links in the description. With that, who will have what it takes to outwit, outplay, and outlast all the rest? This is Survivor 42. Number one, bring back the Edge of Extinction, but as a surprise twist. So track me here. I don't think the Edge of Extinction is all bad, and I do think there is a way to reuse it in the future, but differently and in a way that I think most fans would find enjoyable. The key here is that it would need to be a surprise for everyone. So let's say we are watching Survivor 43, for example, and the merge episode begins. We are at the first challenge, but what's that? The people who were voted off are coming back in for the challenge, but no one, not even the audience, knew they were still in this. We then, in the episode, rewind time back to when the first person was voted out of the game and went to the edge, and we see the entire story of the edge from the time that they arrived to this moment at this challenge. Boom. The twist is fair because we didn't send them to a place to rest and eat like we did with the Outcast twist in season seven. We don't spend excess time with them week after week like in Redemption Island seasons or in the past Edge of Extinction seasons. This basically is a one episode deal that would legitimately surprise everyone and the twist ends at the merge. My thought is that this would work better as a two part episode where the first hour is the flashback and the challenge where someone gets back in and the second hour is the proper merge madness. For those who are super hardcore and know about exit interviews and post game press, Survivor just have to let them all do it and whoever returns just needs to pretend like they're out for good just like everyone else. I think this could work and it would not overshadow a whole season, but whoever comes back in does not get an idol or advantage like before. What do you think about this? Certain moments on Survivor have become iconic. Mm -hmm. Some moments take years to become iconic. Others become iconic the moment they happen. This might be one of them. Oh <laughs> Come on in. Wait, what? I, knew, I, knew, I, knew I knew it. I knew it. Number two, Survivor can stay in Fiji, but go to a different set of islands. Last year, in one of my unpopular opinions videos, I joked that they should stay in Fiji forever. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that's not a joke. I think it's what they're really going to do. Let's think about it like this. Fiji and Survivor are married, but there are so many different islands in Fiji. Right now, I am showing you footage from season 14 when they were just on different islands in Fiji. And you could see that despite being in the same country, this location is still beautiful and could still bring variety. There is only so many times I can see the same confessional locations and same challenge locations. It just becomes distracting, especially when the challenges are just being recycled anyways. The same goes for Tribal Council where we've gone from like these epic locations to what feels like a TV set. Just it like, how are we even on a tropical island? It doesn't feel like it when we're at Tribal. Take a look at this wide shot from season 14. Does that look anything like a modern Fiji season? No which is what I like. So why not stay in Fiji, but let's explore other parts for challenges, camp life, tribal council, whatever. This is one of the highest peaks of my life because I've challenged myself so much in this game and I made it all the way through just as planned. I mean, it's a cool experience. You won't know until you do it, till you give up everything in your lifestyle and come here and get in the dirt, in the mud, in the grind and make it happen. Number three, this one is from Russell Muscle TV. My name is Russell Muscle TV, meaning it's only fitting that my unpopular survivor opinion is that Russell Hant is not a top tier survivor player. I know very unpopular and controversial, but before I dive into why Russell Hant isn't a top tier survivor player, I just want to say thank you to Once Upon an Island for having me on his channel. Like he said, we all have unpopular opinions on Survivor, and it's such an amazing idea to bring everyone's different opinions into a single video. Getting started, we need to address the elephant in the room, my name is Russell Muscle TV, making Russell Hans my arch nemesis in the Survivor community. Russell Hans's appearance on Survivor is what a majority of the community recognizes as a shift from old school to new school Survivor, with Samoa and Heroes vs. Villains back to back. Don't get me wrong, Russell is one insanely entertaining player to watch on television, with his strategic dominance and 
season 19 and season 20. But there's a major difference between an entertaining player and a top tier player. As much as I enjoyed watching Russell play Survivor, he literally does not understand the format of the show and what it takes to win. Finding hidden immunity idols without clues was game changing, and he ushered in a new era of Survivor with strategy being the driving factor over surviving the elements. But at the end of the day, America does not get a vote for who wins the title of Soul Survivor. And so because of Russell's poor jury management skills, I don't think he should be considered a top tier Survivor player. And I believe there's only enough room for one Russell in the Survivor YouTube community, so please consider checking my channel out and subscribing to help me reach my goal of passing Russell Hansen subscribers. The problem with Russell, and I think what he's trying to say to you, is that he doesn't play the game to win. And it's clear in his strategy. He plays a good game to get to the end, but he doesn't play a game to win the game. And that's where he and I differ. And you play the game to win? I do play the game to he win. Does. When have you won? I haven't. But Just I guarantee, saying. given the opportunity, I'd gladly go back and kick your ass all over the place. <laughs> That could be a future season, Rob versus Russell. <laughs> Number four, Vanuatu is a top tier season. Now, what do I mean by top tier season? I mean from the time episode five has a literal earthquake to the time that Chris puts on what could be considered the best final tribal council performance of all time, Vanuatu is amazing. There is so much drama. There are alliances flipping, constant strategy, funny camp life, and the villains of the season getting their due. They get justice served against them. The men versus women aspect shines the most here out of the three times it is used. And I will admit, this season not being in HD and the first four episodes being kind of twist heavy, hold it back. But then you see things like Jeff walking on an active volcano, Eliza annoying everyone, Chris just BSing everyone, Julie Berry flirting with so many people and even making Jeff fall in love with her that after this season, they're dating, but she's flirting with him during the show. Amy goes hardcore anti-men and Rory, he's, he's Rory. Once the show lets go of trying to make twists happen and just lets the cast shine, the season jumps up so fast and it doesn't stop. Because it is so good, I would put it in my top five seasons that I want to rewatch right now. And Twyla's little dance, uh, what the hell, what, what is that? That wasn't Twyla. Well, whatever her name is. Yeah. This show some class, man. We probably I understand would have done, we, if they're proud about it. But we would have done the same thing. No, I don't things. think that we would have done the same thing. Well, I don't think that we would have intentionally it. shoved somebody's nose into it. You know, that was nonsense. That was classless. You feel I'm not pulling my weight? I, I saw you going on a lot of walks. This yeah. is why I go on all my walks. Sarge wants to dictate when people take a crap, when people take a bath. I'm a grown ass man and I don't take orders real well. Number five, in Survivor players exit interviews, I don't care about strategy talk. This one is oddly specific, but I wanna hear about fun and interesting things we didn't see on the show. But as someone who has been listening to a lot of post-game exit interviews, deep dives, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera, unless you were involved in some iconic moment in your season, I truly don't care about the split vote that happened during a pre merge boot that eliminates someone. I, I don't, I don't care. I listen to these interviews for everything else. Someone made a fake idol that didn't get shown? Yes, please. Someone got yelled at by Jeff? Absolutely, tell me more. Someone told a fake story about having cancer and surviving and it made everyone sympathetic towards them? Morally questionable, but this is what I want to hear. I truly do not care for listening to hours of what I would call pointless talk of how a vote went down. I don't. Please stop. The only time it's interesting is if it was like a monumental game shifting move, which happens maybe once or twice a season at most. I would rather listen to a 30 minute interview just jam packed full of fun stuff that happened on the show that we didn't see than listen to four hours of explaining game moves that just give detail as to what we already saw. So please, if you are a future Survivor contestant, try to include more fun stuff in your ex interviews. Number six, this one is from Flynn Masters. My unpopular Survivor opinion is that South Pacific is a really good season of Survivor, maybe even pushing the top 15. I think a lot of people, myself included, push it to the side as a Redemption Island 2.0 and don't really give it a chance. When in reality, this is a very enjoyable season of Survivor. Now, first things first, there are some obvious flaws with this season. Of course, Redemption Island sucks, and this is an all around badly edited season, as players like Cochran, Coach, and Ozzy completely dominate the screen time 
while players like Keith, Whitney, and Rick were invisible. But other than those flaws, I had a lot of fun rewatching this season. The pre-merge is really fun, with Cochran somehow surviving four straight tribal councils, where his name is on the chopping block, with the Elise blind side being the highlight, and of course Ozzy's infamous decision to save Cochran, volunteering to go to Redemption Island himself, only for Cochran to flip on him and Savai at the merge. And speaking of the merge vote, that's an all-time great episode in itself. And while Pogongan does follow, Survivor does it perfectly, as they get the next five Savai eliminations done within three episodes. The endgame is outstanding, with Brandon giving up his immunity to Albert only to be blindsided, Rick's blindsided, and Ozzy almost overcoming it all, only to fall one challenge short. And a big reason why I think this season is so underappreciated is due to Sophie. On the first watch, she comes off as a brat who didn't do anything to win, but on the rewatch, you can appreciate the type of game she knew she had to play that would give her the best shot of winning $1 million. Again, it's not perfect by any means, but I truly do believe South Pacific is a really good season of Survivor. Number 7. We need a good villain or two every season. Weirdly enough, despite the fact that Survivor 42 was better than Survivor 41, Survivor 41 had one thing going for it that I wish we had on 42. There was a villain most of us were actively rooting against. Give me a Shan from season 41 or a fair play from season 7. I want someone who is despised by the fan base, who makes a far and changes the course of the season. This is really what some modern seasons lack the most as they try to make people like Tori from 42 a villain, but she's really just a quirky girl who loved making crazy facial expressions. Fair play actively made up lies to trick people. Russell Hance was nice to people's faces and then trashed them in confessionals until he later devolved and started doing it to their faces as well. And Shan lacked the awareness to see how hypocritical and self-centered she was that it made us all beg for her and anyone who has ever been a villain in the past to be voted off. A strong villain can carry a season, just as long as they don't win at the end. So please, let's get some villains back on Survivor. Deshaun has a moment where he feels like he hasn't been fully heard, so I have to make sure he feels fully heard as a man, but my gameplay is social, and so I need to be the one that's able to move the needle, all the while making everyone feel heard and feel like their opinions matter. So that's what I do as a pastor. I take into consideration all of the information. There's a lot of members. They got a lot of thoughts about this potluck, this evangelistic idea, this trip they want to take. Then I got to hear it all. And I've got to convince them that still my way is the best way. Now it is time for your all's unpopular opinions. This first one says, Cook Islands is one of the worst seasons ever and Natalie should have won against Russell. John says, Cass could have won against Wu and Kagayan if she made it to the final tribal council and had a good performance. Patrick says, Guatemala is a top 10 season. Laura says, even if Cochran doesn't flip at the merch, I think Sophie still wins because she was the best player of the season. Kelly says, season 41 is great and Erica deserved the win. Also, while we're on the subject of deserving, Ben Dreebergen and Chris Underwood deserve their wins as well. Kim Spradlin is a bottom five winner. Daniel says the final four fire making challenge is better for the game than a final four vote. As long as it's known about from the beginning of the season, it's one of the best twists in the game. Giovanni says Sydney from Korong is a better player than Aubrey and Michelle. She had more control than Michelle and understood her jury better than Aubrey. And she would have beaten Aubrey and Ty in the final tribal council by getting Debbie, Scott, Julia, Jason, and Michelle's jury votes. Then she slays winners at war, hypothetically considering she comes back, and successfully votes out Tony and sweeps the jury and becomes another two-time queen like Sandra. Kevin says the joint tribal council in Game Changers was actually really cool and entertaining to watch. I feel like most people don't like it because fan favorite Malcolm gets voted out instead of someone they liked less. Lydia says, I don't like Malcolm and Denise from Survivor Philippines. Tokyo Tourist says, bring back a rock drop final four, no more fire making. Nathan says, Nicaragua is a good season. Jane and Holly's arcs in opposite directions, Fabio's underdog story, Sash playing to recover after losing three of his allies like that, Brenda's downfall, Battle the Jimmies, Marty holding on to his idol and staying against the odds, and compare this to the monotony of the next three seasons that come after this one. It's exciting gameplay more than makes up for a few bad cast members. The one and only Phineas says, HHH is an incredibly underrated season that had a really strong final stretch aside from Ben's bending out. If they revealed fire making from the start, more people would have liked it. Rowan Moon says, I wouldn't want a first boot season. There aren't enough interesting first boots to bring back and it would just be a lot of bad gameplay, which in my opinion isn't very interesting. 
and I gotta say, this is definitely unpopular. I think the bad gameplay is what would make it interesting. Zach Mitchell says, unpopular to most fans, they should have a season with no advantages at all, idols included. However, Jeff should still ask about idols at every vote just to scare people. People thought this would happen in season 31, so maybe they could do it the next time they have a second chance season. Call it Island with no idols or something. Queen Katara says, the fact that Denise and Natalie White survived so many tribal councils makes their wins a lot more impressive than people give them credit for. To me, the only real luck-based aspect of the game is your starting tribe, and so many winners get lucky that they're put by production on the dominant tribe. Denise and Natalie adapting and coming to the merge down in numbers makes it all the more amazing that they won at Final Tribal Council. They did a lot more work than a lot of other winners had to do on their seasons, and it is great evidence of their adaptability. Seth says, Season 41 is a good season. I think the cast is really strong, and while it's unbalanced, the edit kept you guessing who's going to win. All the twists make it really feel like the start of a new era, and I love Danny and Sydney. Magic Window says, I might put Chris Underwood above Bob as a winner because Bob was so clueless and just fell into his win while Chris did make the most of his time back in the game and played that as perfectly as you could imagine. Joseph says Erica is a great survivor winner. She understood threat management perfectly and made the big moves in the end game. If her edit was better, she would be more highly regarded. Nala says Caramon is actually a really good season. The whole Brendan arc in the pre-merge is exciting. Brenda versus Dawn makes a good rivalry. Cochran plays incredible and has to be one of the best Survivor winners. The unliked Philip is back and causes so much chaos, kind of like a new Russell, except with zero strategic capabilities. Mr. Manny says, New school Survivor isn't bad. People are just incredibly closed-minded. Doesn't mean it can't be bad, though. Some of the twists we've seen in the last two seasons are an indication, but the people who go out and play the game choose to do it for a reason. It's because it's still entertaining and the experience is meaningful to them. Even though most of us, including myself, We'll never play the game. We have to remember that it's not the early 2000s anymore. And like everything, Survivor has to change. And we have to understand that as a community, especially if we want it to thrive and continue. Connor says, definitely unpopular to most fans, but Survivor Fiji is an overhated season. Despite the murder of a pre-merge, the merge has two extremely rootable and well-edited players in Earl and Yao Man, another rootable character in Alex, and some really unique arcs in Stacy and Dreams. Also, obviously, the Edgardo boot being a great moment in the evolution of strategy. Starks says, Survivor Philippines has the best auction. I like how almost everybody got some sort of benefit out of it, whether it was through food or advantages. Plus, there were also three people who bid 500 for an item. Even if people bought something and it didn't directly benefit only them, <laughs> Carter, it always benefited other people. Plus, there were some iconic moments there, like Penner eating the chicken and Abby talking about why she wasn't bidding on food. Regina says, we need a recruits only season and it needs to be all people who have never seen the show. This is the closest we will ever get to an old school season. And even this wouldn't be a guarantee. I just think it would be really cool to see a full cast genuinely have to figure things out for the first time. The next unpopular opinion says, Survivor has been going downhill for a while, especially in the casting department, where everyone that plays is now a super fan and knows all the intricacies of the game. It was more entertaining when the cast featured players that didn't know anything about Survivor and had to adapt. Legitness says, Survivor died with season 40. Politics, politics, politics. And yes, there was social slash political elements to the game in early seasons, but there has been a shift from just simply showing what the contestants' views were to highlighting slash showcasing specific political views and issues. LJZI says, I feel like hardcore fans have this notion that only a dominant player can be a satisfying winner. There are plenty of ways to be a good winner, and we all have different winner rankings that aren't based on only how many times they voted correctly. Flip Cam Gamer says, Tom Westman is the most overrated winner in Survivor history. Reason why? He tells Stephanie that he's going on her side, then when Greg and Ian want to vote her out, he's initially against the idea, but decides to go through with it until Janu quits. Then when they get back to camp, he acts like they were going to vote out Janu the whole time. And after Jen is voted out, he gets mad at Ian for trying to vote him out as a big threat when that's part of the game. And he knows he's a big threat and he and Katie emotionally manipulate and lambast Ian for playing the game. For those who don't know what Flip Cam Gamer's talking about, I recommend watching season 10 or at least watching my Tom Westman winner video. The Bot of a God says, Mike is a top 10 winner. He made a serious blunder at the auction, no questions there, but when his back was against the wall, he won like five or six immunities where he would have been voted out as soon as he was vulnerable. Then at Final Travel Council, he gave one of the best all-time speeches to convince a jury that genuinely disliked the guy to nearly unanimously vote for him. Without a Mike win, that season would be terrible. Mike made it a pretty good one. 
Michael says, it seems like a modern, unpopular opinion, but I really enjoy advantages and idle plays. Now it seems like the consensus is other people like them as well, just not when they are overused or overplayed in a given season. Classic example being the Suri vote off, which by the way, I'm assuming Michael's talking about game changers, without a vote casted against her. I honestly love that and want just as many advantages every season. Gretchen says, Courtney, Chris, Cole, Wu, and Eddie were all hilarious and deserve to be considered among the great survivor comedic reliefs. John Mish was a great player and San Juan del Sur and Jacqueline was just a coattail writer. Timothy says the tie and Ghost Island should not have broken. Just call it even Steven and let the wet and Tom bromance live on forever. Munter E says bitter jury is a term used by the fandom to cope with their favorite player losing and every soul survivor, whether you like them or not, deserve their win even if it's only because they're less objectionable than their opponents at Final Tribal. Chloe says, I loved Chris Underwood's win. I thought it was exciting to watch and had me on the edge of my seat talk about an underdog story. If Survivor insists on having Edge of Extinction slash Redemption Island type twist, I see no reason someone sent there shouldn't win. Mr. Pencil Sharpener says, Shot in the Dark is a good twist that needs to be in every season going forward. The best part about it is just the threat of its existence rather than the twist itself. We may never get to see it properly save someone for several seasons, but seeing how people use blind sides to try and dodge it is what makes it so interesting. Peter says, Denise is the second best winner of all time after Tony. She has been on on multiple dysfunctional tribes and somehow never gets voted out. She dominated Philippines, improved her game during Winners at War 100% by taking out Sandra while at the bottom. She was able to move her way into the majority at the end, but was voted out due to Natalie's idol after returning from the edge. Connor says, Survivor Guatemala was the best season with captains. Unlike most other seasons, the returnees don't steal all the airtime as there were many other characters like Judd, Gary, Amy, Jamie, and Rafe that it's sad we never got to see again. Also, I think Bobby John is an underrated returnee who is more introspective in this season, while Stephanie has an overlooked heel turn arc from America Sweetheart to an easy beat at the end. A Red Toilet says, people say that the best person to master the flirt card was Parvati. I personally think Julie Berry from Vanuatu is severely underrated and outshines Parvati significantly in terms of that. Pre-swap, she was in the dominant alliance with younger females, and when swapped to the new tribe, she was down in the numbers as one of two females on that tribe. The other one was someone who didn't care for any of the other girls, preferred hanging out with the males, and fell on the outs with her old tribe. Julie got in the good graces, specifically with Sergeant Chris, to the point they were voting off their own members. When the merge hit, she had all the boys under her spell, as well as the host of the show, Jeff. I mean, just look during the reunion, how Jeff asked almost every other question to her, flipped back with the girls, and had no ill will against her. Julie's main fault in the game was that she was too fun to be around that Leanne decided to be honest with Scout that she and Twyla got replaced. Nobody remembers her because she basically got known for the hot girl who dated Probst. And for the last unpopular opinion, Bear says, from HHH to Island of the Idols, it's the best consecutive stretch of Survivor seasons ever. I like all the winners, the gameplay, memorable players, and each has excellent twists. Even if a twist doesn't land with audiences, I love that the show is making an effort to keep the game fresh. And with that, what are your unpopular Survivor opinions? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and doubly thanks for liking and subscribing. See you all next time.